there we go, folks. <clears throat> now I'm going to uh, get the other instructors unmuted, and we will... And for I, some reason, I, uh, I can't to work, but I think we're good for now. So um, we are ready to go. And Rita, how you doing? Hi, Matt. How are you? Hi, how are you? Good. Uh, Hanging in there. Good, good, good. <laughs> All right. Um, so, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say, whenever you're ready to go, I'm, uh, that's good. We can just end when you uh, need to go. Oh, okay. 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 All right. Okay. All right. Well, what we're talking about, folks, is that today's actually an in-service day at our school district and our uh, my kids are home with me today. So we have some afternoon plans. So we're going to have an abbreviated class for today and we'll have um, a more normal length on Wednesday, but we are going to uh, end things early today. Uh, but I wanted to teach you a couple of things. So we're still having class because I wanted to make sure we taught the rotor today. Uh, that's the main priority and um, probably take a little look at settings too. So hope everyone's uh, doing well. Had a great weekend and everything as we are. Praise God. We're all uh, doing well and excited to be here with all of you today. And um, we're going to get right into this because this, this rotor is so important. And we really need to spend some quality time with this. Now, when we have a um, sighted person using the screen of their device, there's a lot of things that they can do um, simply by moving things around on the screen, simply by tapping on various things that they can see. And of course, for us, that's quite a bit different. Okay. We have to have a lot of guidance on where things are and how to move them around. This is especially important when we're editing text and things of that nature. Now we've already seen some of that with the voiceover cursor and tapping once to bring focus to items, double tapping to activate them and so on. Today we're gonna learn about a whole new tool and a couple of new gestures. And this has to do with the rotor. All right, so the rotor is a virtual on-screen control, all right? Virtual meaning it appears on the screen. It's not something that, you know, all right? It, it is dynamic and it's context aware. So what do those terms mean? Dynamic means it changes depending on what it needs to do. It can have different options without you having to tell it that it needs to have different options. And how does it get those different options? Because it's context aware, meaning it, it knows what you're doing and based on what you're doing, it will, it will be dynamic, it will have different options. So if your voiceover cursor is focused on an edit field, it may have a certain set of options. If your voiceover cursor is focused on a value adjuster, like to change volume or to pick a date or select a state in an online form, you're going to have different rotor options depending on where you are. Now, there are also user customizable rotor options that appear based upon your settings. 
And so you can add and remove things from the rotor and you can reorganize things in the rotor as well. The rotor is a way essentially of providing you the ability to do things that you couldn't otherwise do very easily. As a voiceover user, this rotor is very critical, okay? Non-voiceover users do not have a rotor. There are other ways that they can do things. But for us, we have a rotor. Now, there are two components to... Oh, go ahead, Rita. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I was just... No, no, you're fine. I was just going to interject right there. The, the rotor concept uh, is like as if you were pulling up a menu. So for people who are used to, you know, uh, you know, context sensitive help on a computer, um, you know, this rotor is a way to bring up options as if you were on a computer and you hit the, the F1 key or whatever, you know, whatever key that brings up some help for you. It brings up these other options that persons who are not running voiceover They've got other ways, like Matt was saying, to get to it. But we, as voiceover users, uh, have this suite of options that we can grab very quickly. And you can customize this, as, as Matt's going to explain. So anyway, just wanted to throw that in. Absolutely. Absolutely. So now that we understand a little bit about what the rotor is, how do we access it? Well, first of all, there are two parts to accessing the rotor. There is selecting which rotor option or which rotor setting you want. And then there is actually doing whatever that rotor setting allows you to do. And I'll explain in a moment. Just to give you a quick example of that, maybe you wanna simply Navigate word by word on screen so you can hear each word individually, especially useful when you're editing, right? Well, there is a way to set the rotor to word navigation. Once you set the rotor to word navigation, you have to be able to actually move word by word. So two parts to the rotor, making the setting choice and then actually using it, essentially. To set the rotor, to change the, the, the rotor option that is selected, this is a two finger gesture. You're gonna place two fingers on the screen and you're gonna rotate them as if you were turning a dial. You're gonna rotate them clockwise or counterclockwise. It's up to you, you can go both directions. And when you do that actually, by the way, there is, a, uh, there is a, an on-screen image that appears for those folks who can see to show them that they're turning the rotor. Now, I don't want you to be confused. Some people say, well, you, you know, in order to even do anything with the rotor, you have to first turn it. No, you're always going to have an active rotor setting of some sort. Okay. But it's when you place those two fingers, it, it allows you to change the, the rotor setting. You can turn clockwise or counterclockwise with two fingers. Um, so what I do, and then I'm going to let Rita jump in here and, and give her uh, experiences and her thoughts on this too. But what I like to do is like, for example, if I'm holding my phone, since we're talking about phones in this class specifically, uh, if I'm holding my phone in my left hand, kind of fingers around the phone and, and the, the, the back of the phone is sort of maybe resting against my palm sort of, then I can just take the right hand and I can rotate to the right, to the left. And I've got that leverage that it, provides to me by having the phone pressed against the other hand. So it gives me a, a, a nice lever kind of experience there. Now, Rita, what are your thoughts on turning the rotor? I know sometimes this is a struggle for some people. Well, it, it is a struggle for some people. And once you get it, once you've got the muscle memory, you're on, you know, but it's people really do struggle with this. And uh, I, think of it as an old time dial, like you're in a car and you're turning the dial to change the station. So I take my thumb and my forefinger and 
both of them have to make contact on the screen, very light contact. <laughs> and I turn them in a twisting motion and you hear it go, roop, roop. it makes a little noise and it turns to different things that are available on that rotor, such as characters, words, lines, sentences, headings. Uh, and some people use two fingers. They'll take one finger and they'll bring it down on the screen is simultaneously they'll bring the other finger and turn it up like you're like so so takes two hands to turn a dial but it's like turning a dial uh and most people have that concept but they they overthink it i think a lot of times and they just can't get this because it's hard to imagine doing that on a flat surface the dial right. you know would normally be three-dimensional so now you have this on screen experience and we tell you to turn a dial and yeah you can overthink it but I, you're right about what you said. Some people, if they're not getting it with the two fingers, they'll, they'll actually do one finger on each hand and move one up and the other one down. And that does work. Um, but, you know, it, you got you to gotta have that, as I say, that sort of leverage that, that, that to me, I, I find if I can stabilize the device with the other hand, then I can really, you know, cause you gotta, it's gotta be very clear uh, that motion. And, and so uh, I don't know what else Rita, I didn't mean to interrupt you there, but. No, you didn't interrupt. It was all good. Um, so this concept of turning this virtual dial is critical because this rotor will be essential to bring up this menu of options so that you can do things like you can edit, you can select text, you can copy things, you can go to different headings. Like say you're in a really complicated web page and you wanna navigate by headings. So you turn this rotor and it'll say headings and then you just flick down and it'll go heading one, heading two, heading three. You know, and so it's, it's critical to master this gesture with voiceover. And again, these gestures are feather light. Uh, it is not pressure that controls what's happening on the phone. As a matter of fact, the more pressure you use, it'll get confused, you know? So you need to really practice these voiceover gestures like on the table before you touch the phone, um, go into voiceover practice mode with a four finger double tap and practice this rotor, it'll say rotor, okay? As you do this two finger twist. Um, and then you exit out of voiceover practice with a four finger double tap, but it's the way to get to the options. Um, so there's, <laughs> that's what I got. <laughs> all right, all right, awesome. So let's talk about some of the ways that we can use the rotor and, and some of the reasons that we might use the rotor. We already mentioned one of them, which is to read your screen by characters and words. And I mentioned this in the editing scenario where it's especially important in my opinion, right? Because we've already talked about um, in, in other classes, maybe we haven't addressed it yet in this class, but I promise we will when we start talking about typing and dictation and stuff, which is going to be on Wednesday, since we're, you know, keeping it pretty short today. Uh, but we'll do that on Wednesday. Praise God, that's going to be very powerful for you, because you'll start learning about text entry, right, how to enter those email addresses to log in, how to type a note in the notes app, you know, all these things we're going to learn. And we're going to, we're going to, I, I guarantee it, we're going to be on this soapbox, we're going to hound you about don't use the I'm blind excuse for poor dictation. Uh, that's just, we are sticklers about that on the TTJ team. Every, you know, every one of us, we believe that's selling yourself short. If you say, well, I'm using dictation, please excuse any errors. No, you fix the errors, learn how to do it. Okay. It's not hard. It takes practice. It takes practice and it can be challenging and it can feel frustrating at time for, times for some people, but you'll get it. You will get it. But in order to do that, you have to know how to navigate by characters and words because you got to go back and read. Well, did I spell this? It sounds weird. A voiceover says misspelled. Let me see how I spelled it. I go back and read it. 
character by character, you know, or, uh, you know, I dictated uh, the word to, but is it T-O-O or is it T-W-O or is it T-O, you know, so I'm going to go back and read character by character. So moving on screen by uh, different values like that can be very important when you're editing, but not just when you're editing. Maybe sometimes you're reading on the web and you want to see how a certain word is spelled, or you didn't understand a certain word when voiceover spoke it. So you want to look and see what it was. There are plenty of cases, um, both in edit fields and also when you're not in an edit field, where you may want to see what is on screen by characters, by words, by lines, things of that nature. So that is one way to use the rotor options. By default, when you first get a new iPhone, characters and words will always be in the rotor already. And those are constants, as long as they're selected in your settings, which they are by default, they're always gonna be there no matter what else is in the rotor, characters and words will always be there. And so what you do is you put two fingers on the screen and you rotate that dial, that imaginary dial, until you hear characters or words. And usually they're right beside each other, characters and then one turn to the right and you get words typically. Again, you can reorder this, you can, you know, move it around, you can even take those things out of the rotor if you didn't want them, but can't imagine why you wouldn't. But anyway, they're there by default, and typically right beside each other. So if I want to read by word, I'm going to turn the rotor, you know, until I hear um, words. And then what I will do, how do I then actually read word by word. How do I actually move by whatever the rotor is selected? Remember, I told you there's two parts to the rotor. Well, here's the second part. Remember, I told you so far up until today, all navigation on screen has been left to right, right to left. We said we're not going to worry about the up and down gesture at all. Well, today we introduce the up and down gesture, the one finger swipe up and the one finger swipe down. Some people call it a flick, but again, remember I told you they're interchangeable terms. So I'm going to just, I, I, you know, fl flick, swipe, whatever. One finger up and down. So when you set the rotor to words, for example, if you swipe up with one finger, you will move to the previous word. If you swipe down with one finger, you will move to the next word. And the same thing is true with characters. You turn that rotor with two fingers, set it to characters, swipe down to go to the next letter, the next character on the screen, and swipe up to go to the previous character on the screen on whatever you have, wherever you have that voiceover cursor at that moment. You can also do this with lines. And, uh, and so, you know, it's the same concept, okay? Down to go to the next line, up to go to the previous. I'll demonstrate very quickly. Um, let's just open up something here and I'm going to, I'm going to open up Safari. I know we haven't taught Safari yet. We will in a couple of weeks, but I want to open up Safari because it will give me something to read more than just my home screen. Right. So let's, um, oh, I got to go to a website where I've got some articles. Let's go to one of my favorite websites, Mac rumors. I love to, you know, people follow Apple like they're paparazzi, you know, like they're a celebrity. And uh, in many ways they are, but um, they will um, post things about Apple, upcoming potential products and events and rumors that we hear about. And all right. So here's, here's, um, oh, here's an interesting thing that we see on Mac rumors anyway. For those of you running iOS 16, Apple releases iOS 16.0.3. With fixes for notification delays, CarPlay microphone levels, and more. This was just today, as of the 1:17 p.m. Eastern time. Um, so just a little bit ago, they released a, a bug fix update. That's not a beta. That's a regular update for everybody. So you may want to check into that if you haven't already. But let's look. If I want to read this article, I swipe to the right. Let's turn it up a little. Julie Clover, Apple today released iOS 16.3, a minor bug fix update that comes a few weeks after the launch of the... Okay. Now, if I want to look at that word by word, I'm going to turn my rotor, and I happen to think I probably know where my rotor is at already, so I'm going to turn to the left counterclockwise because I think that'll be the quickest path to get there. Text selection. Lines. 
Words. There's words. Let's read by swiping down one finger. Swipe down. Apple. Today. Released. iOS. And if I swipe back up, it'll go back to the previous word. iOS. Released. Today. Apple. All right, let's swipe down again. Apple. Today. iOS. 16.3. That's interesting the way voiceover says 16.3. I suspect it's 16.0.3, but I want to see. So I'll swipe back up to get to the beginning of that word. 16.3. Now let's look at it character by character. So I'll turn my rotor to characters. Characters. And we'll swipe down with one finger to read one character at a time. One, six, period, zero, period, three. Yep, that's what it is. 16.0.3. Swipe back up. Three, period, zero, period, six, one, cap S. Okay. So we just read backwards now, character by character. So you can understand this demo and uh, you got a chance to see how to read, you know, character by character, word by word. And again, as I said, in many instances, you can do it by line as well if you have lines in your rotor. So that is an example of one way in which we can use the rotor. Now, when we teach editing, because we will teach text editing, you know, very extensively later on in this class. And, and then you'll see even more critical uses for that um, and understanding where the cursor is, you know, relative to the characters that you're typing and stuff. You'll get a feel for all of that when we do actual text editing. That's not the purpose of today's class. Today is just to show you we can do that with the rotor. Now, if I, um, if I want to talk about something else that we can do with the rotor, let's talk about um the next thing which is uh, let's talk about additional uh special options that that only show up when they're needed these are these dynamic context aware sort of contextual options right so there will be certain settings in the rotor when you turn left and right with two fingers when you rotate that will only be there when they are needed okay now one of them is misspelled words we can do spell checks with our rotor. And this feature is specifically designed for voiceover users. If we are typing some text, writing an email, a pages document, a note, even, a, you know, whatever, um, we want to probably make sure things are spelled correctly. And if we are cited, the way we're going to do that is we're just going to glance through our document and we're going to find the words that are underlined in red that are misspelled, okay? And then we can tap on them with that long press gesture we learned about last week, and we can get replacements or we can manually try to correct them. Now, voiceover users have that same option, by the way, because when you are editing and you're reading through your, your characters and your words and so forth, like we just taught you, when a word is misspelled, voiceover is going to announce that. When it's red underlined, it's going to say misspelled word, okay? Or misspelled. So you'll know that it is misspelled, okay? And then you have the same option. There's a way to get the replacements, which we'll teach when we teach editing. Um, there's a way to get the replacements for the misspelled word, or of course, manually try to respell it and retype it. So you have that same option. But the difference is for us as voiceover users, it might be a little bit more challenging to glance through an entire document to find all the red underlying words. You, you can do it. You can keep reading as you proofread. When you hear misspelled, you know that you got to check it. And really, you should proofread that way anyway, especially in, you know, really important professional documents. You're going to want to proofread like that, you know, the whole thing. But there is an option for us voiceover users to do a global spell check to just automatically jump to every misspelled word so that we can fix it. And so that misspelled words item appears in the rotor when it is appropriate in, in situations where you're in an edit field and, you know, there's typed text and so forth, you'll see that misspelled words option. We're not going to teach you how to use it today. We will when we teach editing, but I just want to point out, it's one of those sort of context aware options that you don't have to go to settings and enable it. It just appears there when it is needed. Okay. It's smart enough to know when it should be there and then it appears. Now there's another one that you do have to add to the rotor. Um, and uh, it is, but it's also uh, something that, that is, you know, contextual. So it appears when it's needed, but first you have to turn it on. It's not there by default. And that one is text selection. Text selection 
allows you a quick way to select and deselect words in a paragraph or you know in a sentence or whatever you want to do. Now, obviously, again, very useful for editing because you can go and select multiple words and copy them, delete them, paste, you know, whatever you want to do. Bold, you know, select a phrase and then bold it or whatever. So certainly it's useful for editing. Again, we're not going to teach you how to use it today. We will teach it when we teach editing. But um, there are other uses for text selection too. For example, you heard text selection in my rotor just a moment ago, maybe, which, um, which was uh, basically for the, oh guys, somebody's at my door. Hang on guys. Okay, sorry about that, guys. Thanks for your patience. So uh, the um, the text selection appeared in my rotor even in Safari a few minutes ago. Now, why would anyone want text selection in the rotor when they were using Safari? And the answer is because maybe you want to select part of a website and share it with somebody. So that's a way you can do that. So it's going to appear in other places besides just edit fields. It's going to appear in Safari, in Mail different scenarios like this, but you have to enable this one first from settings. That is not one that's only context aware. It is context aware, but it also has to be enabled. Okay. Um, so it's, it's a great option. I highly recommend everybody enable it if you've never done so, because um, we're going to use it later on when we learn about text selection. The thing is, there's another way to select text without that being in the rotor, um, but I think it's much more complex for somebody who is not sighted and who may not have a real great spatial awareness, um, I think it's a lot easier to use the rotor text selection option if, if you can. So you need to enable it in order to do that. But that's another one of those sort of context aware things also. Here's another context aware option that we don't have to enable in our settings. It just appears when it's needed. And that is the value adjustment option or adjust value. This automatically, um, happens when you land on a value adjuster, like for example, a volume slider. You can turn up and down the volume. Or how about a, uh, a scrub bar? What is a scrub bar? Well, did you ever notice when you're watching a video, uh, maybe a sighted person watches a video and they can scrub real quick through the video and say, oh, I wanna jump to you know 10 minutes ahead or something. Or if you're listening to music, how can I quickly get to a later part of a song? or a podcast, or, or go back again, you know, go to an earlier part. That's a scrub bar. And voiceover says track position. And you can swipe up and down to jump, you know, from one minute to two minutes, three minutes, whatever, back and forth. And that is a scrub bar. As soon as your cursor, as soon as your voiceover cursor lands on a scrub bar, the adjust value option becomes available in the rotor. And not only does it become available, you're automatically already on it. So whatever your rotor was on before, if you had your rotor set to characters, for example, or words, as soon as you swipe left and right and land on or touch and land on a value adjuster, the rotor setting automatically goes to adjust value. You can change it if you need to read by character or something, but otherwise it's on adjust value so that automatically without having to set the rotor, you can swipe up and down with one finger to change the value. And then if you swipe to the left or to the right to sort of get off of that value adjuster, the rotor automatically goes back to whatever it was on before, characters, words, wherever you, whatever you had it on. So it really is cool. And this is where, again, not only is it uh, context aware, but the rotor automatically defaults to that option. So you land on a volume slider, you're already going to be on the adjust value rotor option. All you got to do is swipe up with one finger or swipe down with one finger to change the volume. That's why most people don't even realize that's actually a rotor option because as soon as they land on 
the value adjuster, the, the rotor automatically goes to that so they don't have to mess with it, okay? But it is really and truly a rotor setting. So this is useful for volume adjustments. It's useful for scrub bars. It's also useful, as I mentioned, for example, if you are selecting a date in, in a date picker. Now the Apple calendar and most calendar apps don't actually use date pickers, okay? There's a different way to, to access them and we will teach that when we teach calendar in a couple of weeks, maybe even next week, but, the, but some apps do. Some apps use date pickers and there are plenty of pickers around for other things, okay? Something as simple as AM to PM in the clock might be a picker. And I think it is on, in retrospect. We'll teach that one on Wednesday. Um, or how about, as I mentioned, selecting a state when you're filling out a form. Now, I typically don't do this because I auto fill. So praise God, I don't have to fill anything out. It's automatic. But, you know, occasionally a form will require you to do that. Or maybe there's something else you have to select. And it says it's a picker. Well, that's value adjust. That's what it is. And the rotor will automatically land on the adjust value option whenever you focus on that picker. So then you can just swipe up or down and make your selection. Now, um, this is another one of those context-aware rotor options. I'm going to tell you about one more context-aware rotor option for now, and then I'll move on to other things that, that can be in the rotor. This one is called actions. And actions is another one that when you are on an item that has rotor actions, the rotor setting automatically defaults to actions, okay? It automatically lands on actions so you don't have to turn and rotate the rotor first. This is true in a lot of places. A lot of items have actions in the rotor. And you'll hear voiceover say, sometimes it'll say actions available. Sometimes it'll say swipe up or down with one finger to choose a custom action, then double tap, something like that. And this is the actions rotor option. If you turn your rotor with two fingers to the left and to the right, you will hear actions as one of the choices. And it is when it's needed. As I said, it'll disappear when you don't need it. It's actually present when you're on a home screen app. If you are on the home screen and you're swiping around to different apps, all the apps have actions. Let me let you hear something here. I should be able to Apple releases iOS 16. Get out of the uh, Safari app. App Store. Double tap to open. Now, if I swipe up with one finger, if I, let me just, hold on, sorry there, guys. If I swipe up with one finger. Edit mode. Activate default. There's two actions there, edit mode and activate. And it tells me that activate is default, which means that if I don't swipe up or down at all and I just double tap, that's what I'm going to get is the activate option. But if I swipe up first or down first, I'm going to hear edit mode. I can double tap to enter edit mode, which we'll learn about later. But you can see there were rotor actions there. Uh, so, and even though voiceover didn't say actions available because it's just the home screen, sometimes it will, sometimes it won't. But it is, it is definitely a rotor action. If I turn my rotor left or right, you'd hear actions. And as I said, this appears only when it's needed, but it's used in a lot of places. Oftentimes, though, not always, your rotor actions can mimic what you get in the long press menu. Remember, we taught long press last week, how if we double tap and hold on an item or triple tap on an item, we're going to get a context menu. Many times, the options in the actions rotor are similar to what is in the long press context menu. But I always advise students and, and everybody not to rely on it being the same because frequently what you'll see is that they'll put the most common items in the rotor action uh, menu but not all of them and that's because they're trying to you know make it so the rotor's not too long i suppose and so if they if people say well i don't ever use the long press because i just use my rotor and i use actions well you're probably missing out on something you might like in some cases it's fine but you at least want to check once in a while, see what's in the long press menu and compare. But that is a place where rotor actions are useful. Oftentimes they do have similar um, items to what's in the long press context menus. Okay, so that's rotor actions. And I, I said to you that that was the last uh, context aware rotor option I was going to discuss, but I am going to mention one more quickly, and that is the edit rotor option, which again, appears only when it's needed. When you're in an edit field, 
um, you'll see edit in the rotor. And that's going to have things like copy, select, select all. Um, maybe in some apps, it'll have like bold and italics and things like that. It'll have paste if you've already selected something and, and copied it to the clipboard. For example, you'll see paste. <coughs> Excuse me. This is in the edit rotor option, which is an item in the rotor that appears when it is needed. You don't have to enable it from settings. Okay. It's just there when you need it. And again, there are other ways of doing this typically too. A lot of this stuff anyway, but it's a great way to make it happen. There are tons of other context aware rotor options that appear. They appear only when they're needed. And sometimes they're specific to a different app. That's what's so cool is Apple's given developers the freedom to do this. If you're in a spreadsheet app, for example, you might have rotor options to navigate by row. Or um, if you're in a, uh, a live TV app, you might have a rotor option to navigate through channels. It is really, really cool how people can customize, how developers can customize the rotor with these dynamic contextual rotor items. But let's talk about some other items that you can choose to have in the rotor. For one thing, we can have different voiceover settings in the rotor. I'm not a big fan of this personally. I don't like to do this because I don't typically change my voiceover settings very often. And what I find is that if a person inadvertently you know, changes them, they're just getting used to the rotor, they may make a mistake and, and all of a sudden something isn't working the way they want it to because they accidentally you know, changed it in the rotor. So I'm not a fan of having this stuff in the rotor, but some people love it. And so that's fine. That's again, we're gonna say a lot throughout this course personal preference. You're going to hear that from us a lot. And it definitely is that. So for example, you can have your voiceover volume in the rotor. It just says volume, but it is the voiceover volume that we're dealing with. What we'll learn is that the iPhone has multiple types of volume. You can have voiceover at one volume and you're ringing and sound effects at another volume and Siri at another. Okay. So all this is customizable. So the one that goes in the rotor is voiceover volume. Um, you can have that in the rotor. You can have speaking rate in the rotor if you want to change how, how quickly voiceover speaks. Okay, there are other ways to do these things, but some people like to have those options in the rotor. So you can. Um, you can change the uh, audio ducking, whether or not voiceover, um, well, let me rephrase that, whether or not the music and sound effects of your device get quiet when voiceover is speaking. You can have that on or off. It's a setting I prefer to keep off in case anyone's curious, but uh, again, personal preference. <clears throat> now, there's a lot more, but those are a few examples of settings, voiceover settings that you can have in the rotor. One that I do have in the rotor is typing mode. We're going to learn about typing mode on Wednesday, so I'm not really going to address what that does right now, but understand that that's another one you can definitely have in your rotor. Some people have language in their rotor because they like to switch between different US voices or UK voices, or maybe even some other languages if they want to, and they can go back and forth. So a lot of people like to have rotor languages. Yeah. All right, something else. Uh, there are all kinds of ways to navigate, especially on websites. We can navigate by headings. We can navigate by links. We can navigate by visited links. We can navigate by form controls. We can navigate by images. We can navigate by static text, all kinds of options, right? We can navigate by buttons. If you want, you can enable these and a whole bunch more for your rotor. Now, I don't have a bunch. I do have headings in there because I love navigating web pages by heading when you can. I have links in there. I have form controls in there. Uh, that might be all, maybe there's a couple more, but I think those are the main ones I have for, you know, that, that tend to be mostly for websites. Not always because apps can be set up in headings and stuff too, but typically that's what we think of as web pages. So all of those and a whole bunch more, we navigate by headings, we navigate by links. You can enable and disable those being in your rotor as well. There are also certain types of on-screen input methods that can be enabled in the rotor. So later on in this course, we are going to learn that voiceover supports handwriting. Now, this is not to be confused with apps that support handwriting in text fields, which many of them do. Um, for example, especially on iPad, especially on iPad, you can open up a note 
and you can use the scribble feature to start writing in that note and it will the written the, the the writing that you do the handwriting will show up as actual written text searchable and everything and that's especially true on ipad and really on ipad it's anywhere that accepts text you can scribble like that that's a non voiceover feature that's an everybody feature but there's a specific voiceover handwriting feature and this is especially useful for people who want to silently enter a passcode or who want to handwrite to find items on their screen. So there is a voiceover handwriting feature and that is yet another option that can be put in the rotor if you so choose. Another one, Braille screen input or BSI, as we sometimes call it for short. Again, not something we're gonna learn about until much later on in the course, but it's another input method. If you are really, really comfortable with Braille, you can type on screen, virtual typing, placing your fingers in the positions of the dots for the, the Braille, you know, six character Braille experience, or I don't know if they do eight character, but you know, we'll, we'll learn about that later in the course. And that's Braille screen input. So you can put that in the rotor. And then what you do is when you're in an edit field, you turn to Braille screen input, or you turn to handwriting with that two finger rotation left and right. And that's what allows you to then use it, okay? So there's so many different options like this and so many more that we're not gonna cover. I mean, it, like anything else, you gotta explore on your own and so forth. And uh, you know, I think what I wanna do is uh, let Rita uh, have a moment to add anything she wants and trainer Cliff is here um, and he, uh, well, I'll unmute him. And then what, if, I don't know if he can unmute actually, but we'll see. Yeah. And then what we'll do is we'll uh, bring it to a close for today. We're gonna end early today, but we'll take any questions we have. Go ahead, Rita. Um, I think the, the thing to remember related to the rotor is there is uh, sometimes when people get in trouble, it's because they've positioned the rotor with something like, say, say speaking rate. They've got that in the rotor. OK, and then they start touching their phone and they accidentally turn the speaking rate up to, you know, 100 <laughs> percent. OK, and then they can't understand the voiceover. And they can't figure out how it's talking so fast and they forget to turn the rotor back to speaking rate to, you know, flick down to, to adjust. So sometimes when we're troubleshooting with people, there's mistakes or what, I don't want to call it a mistake, but there's issues with the rotor, like, um, or they put, um, there's a, uh, an option that voiceover settings has for screen recognition, uh, image recognition, and text recognition. There's three options. And text recognition and image recognition are amazing AI, artificial intelligence options that help us know what's in a visual picture or what's in a graphic. Um, and then there's something called screen recognition, which if an app is not very accessible, not very user friendly, sometimes you could turn on screen recognition and it'll help you navigate, okay, to understand what's going on in that app. And people will enable this screen recognition in the rotor. So they turn the rotor and they've got it on screen recognition and then they forget to turn it off. And then they open a, a regular app, like an Apple stock app, you know, a regular app, like in you know, a messages app, contacts app. And then they can't navigate because screen recognition, since the app is already accessible, if you turn on screen recognition, it messes up. You can't navigate with voiceover. And so you got to turn screen recognition off. And we see this a lot with in, uh, people who've been using iPhones for a long time. They've, they've accidentally turned on screen recognition when it didn't need to be turned on and they forgot to turn it off in the rotor. Or say languages, say they put languages in their rotor. Well, then they're working in something and they've changed the language or whatever. And all at once it starts talking in, in something else and they don't understand what they did. And so, um, there's some things in the rotor that you cannot take out, you know, that, that, that are system uh, set. And then other things, there, there must be, oh my gosh, 
50 or so. One time we counted how many items are, you know, possible to put in a rotor. Um, I can't remember the number, but it was a lot. And so if you've got a lot of things in your rotor and you're trying to get to one thing, well, sometimes you got to keep turning the rotor to get to that. And the more items you've got in your rotor, the more you have to flick through to, to get to the thing you want. Um, so I would be careful about what you put in your rotor um, voluntarily. You know, it's like headings uh, are essential, you know, I think, you know, that's, I would always have that in the rotor. So, so you can, this is very customizable. And again, just another uh, point, like Matt was saying, some things default automatically. So if, say, for example, you're in your mail app and you've got your list of mail messages and you haven't opened one yet. And so you flick right to go to the first mail message and and say it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's say it's an advertisement or something you want to delete. You can just flick up with one finger and the rotor action defaults to actions. So you can read this mail later. You can delete it. You can activate it. You can move it to a folder. There's all these actions you can take on that mail message without even opening the mail message. Um, so that's the beauty of getting this uh, finger gymnastics <laughs> that we call, you know, when you're using these voiceover uh, gestures. Um, if you can master these, it's, it's a, just amazing what you can do with your phone. That's my input, Matt. All right. Awesome. Awesome. And I'm glad you brought up that voiceover recognition because that's something that you're, you're absolutely right. Screen recognition can be really useful when you need it, but I have seen many occasions where people have accidentally turned it on and, you know, oh, I, 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 this app worked perfectly yesterday and now I can't even use it, you know, and it's an app that's accessible without screen recognition. So when you turn screen recognition on, it really messes with the apps that are already accessible. So I yes. like to have that in the rotor and because I like to be able to use it on demand when I need it. And I'm telling you, screen recognition has actually come in handy for me at times. Um, so I like it in the rotor, but you've got to be aware of that. And, and also, I agree with Rita. I just want to echo that statement about, yes, I like to keep my rotor very clean. I don't like to have a bunch of stuff in my rotor because the more you have in your rotor, the more stuff you have to turn through to get to what you really want. So I like to keep my rotor very clean. We're gonna end in just a moment, but I wanna do one final thing here. I want to, uh, there's, there's the dog getting her two cents and I couldn't turn on voice isolation today for some odd reason. I, sometimes you have to like restart and then Zoom will let you, I don't know why, it seems to be a Zoom thing, but um, anyway, um, I, wanna, I think we had a raised hand too. So let me check on Cliff. I don't know if he's able to talk today, see if he wants to add anything about the rotor. Um, but he may not be able to speak anyway with his job. So let's just take a quick look. Gonna get to Cliff here. Actually, I don't even see him in here anymore. So he may have had to step away. All right. Let's do this. Let's look for the raised hands here. Oh, there's Cliff. There's Cliff. There's Cliff. Okay, so here's Cliff first. Okay, Cliff, you're a, you're a co-host now, and uh, you can unmute if you have anything to add. Then we'll take the raised hands. 
only thing that I would add is the thing that we have always said, and it became it's become a theme now is the rotor is your friend. But like Matt, I keep mine clean. I think I have maybe five things there, which would be language because I like to switch voices on the fly, um, volume, speech, speed. Because I read my books in a slower uh, speed than I would do everything else. And I think I have, and that's about it. Everything else would show up as needed. Like Rita was talking about with the actions, with the email, delete and stuff like that. You don't have to put that stuff there. But I think I have buttons and links and headings in there for the web. But other than that, the rotor's your friend, but I wouldn't clutter it up because you won't, you don't want to turn on something by accident, like a hint to um, screen recognition. That's something that I probably almost never use because I'm spoiled and I have sided family in my house. So that's my screen recognition, <laughs> but I don't put it in. <laughs> but as you'll learn, as we get into different elements of learning voiceover um, with iPhone for or, um, uh, iOS 16, there's things that you can set to have quick settings come up automatically so you don't have to go to the rotor or you don't have to add things to your rotor you can just bring these settings up and change them on the fly but that's another topic for another day but right i'll just echo it like actually that's for when yes we're gonna learn that on wednesday exactly okay but exactly. i would echo keeping your rotor clean but remember that the rotor is your friend if you can't find something that's usually where it would be at yep exactly absolutely yeah. Uh, very good. Yep. All right. Let's take a look at these raised hands. Seems like we got quite a few here. Alphabetical order, starting with Beth. Okay. There we go. Uh, hi, Matt. Everybody. Um, hi. Actually, you. I think you. I think you answered my my question. I was going to ask about quick settings. Did you say you're going to, if you're going to go into that Wednesday, then I'll just wait till Wednesday, but I haven't tried it, but it sounds like it's a, a really neat thing to, to work with. Have you found it useful? Well, yes, I, I, I find it useful in theory. I almost never change my voiceover settings, like literally almost never. Uh, so I don't use it much, but I do find it very useful. I'm glad Is it was added. It's and for? I think it's a, a brilliant option and we are going to it's for voiceover settings that's it okay mm -hmm. yes mm -hmm. yes yes and we it's... we are going to learn about it on wednesday absolutely okay thanks all right thank you let's see who else we have here let's see Okay. Diane. There you go, Diane. It's not letting me. There you are. Well. Hi there. Hi. Um, okay, can you hear me? It said it said tell me. You weren't allowing me to unmute and then. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, my question is, what are containers? Containers are uh, segments, like say, for example, in the mail app, um, a container would be, one would be the heading of a mail, you know, like who, from, sent, date. The next container would be the body of the message. Oh, it's, okay. it's something very oh. seldom used, and it's more useful on an iPad than a phone. I think that's my opinion. Okay. Yeah, it was in somehow. I, it was in my uh, rotor. I I haven't used it. I'm going to take it out. I'm um, on my phone, especially. I because I don't. I, I use wouldn't, it. Diane. You I, would. Okay. Personal personal preference. I would not. I, I mean. It, it, on an iPhone, maybe I agree. I agree with Rita. It's more uh, uh, of more value on an iPad, but it's one of those things where maybe if if nothing else works, it might. You know, it's it's oh, it's, it's okay. not a bad thing to keep in the rotor. Um, oh, and okay. I, but I do agree with Rita. It's more use on the iPad. I don't think it. I, I don't think I have it in my iPhone rotor. If I'm remembering correctly, maybe. Yeah, but I, I don't, don't think so. I think yeah. I, but I do have it in the iPad rotor. Yes. Yeah, okay. I've just never used it and I didn't know what it was. So I thought, oh, okay. I'll just ask. All right. 
<laughs> All right. Thanks. Okay. All right. Take care. Sure. Um, Debbie. Need help with anything higher? You got it. There we go. There we go. Hi. Okay. Hi, there. hi Matt. Um, hi. My computer. My computer just died. I had to come back in, so I missed a little bit, and it got me thinking. Have you been able to get the first two sessions up on YouTube yet? I've been checking, and I didn't know if I was in the wrong place or what. No, we are going to be sending out a link to those. I, I waited a little bit because we were still getting a bunch of new newsletter subscribers. It was like literally oh, doubling. I see. Okay. Every time. So I just I waited a little bit. We, I will be sending that out probably today. Okay. Because I missed a little bit today and I thought, ooh, I'm going to want to go back to that and see what I missed. <laughs> My computer just died. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay. Delilah. Okay. Hello, Matt. Hi. I just want to, <laughs> I really want to testify to that screen recognition. Last year, when I got a new iPhone, everything was working great for a few days. And then I was coming up with apps that I just could not use. And especially the one that was driving me nuts was the message app. I could not send messages. Everything was just totally in a disarray. So I take my phone back to Verizon and they can't figure out what the problem is either, you know. So the guy, he takes my phone and does a few things. Of course, he doesn't have, turns off voiceover, you know, for himself and everything's working good. But he told me, okay, he says, try it again. And if the problem arises again, come back and I'll order you a new phone. Well, a couple of days later, my phone's acting the same way. I take it back. I get a new telephone. Then things are going good for a little bit, for about another week or so. And then again, I started having this problem. And I was on another group, and I mentioned this problem. And somebody said to me, do you by any chance have uh, screen recognition turned on? And I looked, and it was. So I turned it off and my phone worked great after that. So it, yeah. it really can mess you up. <laughs> yes. Right, right. When you are using an app that's already accessible that doesn't need screen recognition, you definitely uh -huh. want to keep screen recognition off. Very, very good. Very good story. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I, I, I really felt bad after that. It's like, oh my gosh, I went and got a new phone. You know? <laughs> mm. <laughs> I was, you know, Verizon, at least Verizon, tried to make it right with me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's great. Okay. That's great. All right, you take care. Um, there's a, a, a raised hand I missed in the A's here, and I voiceover is pronouncing it a recall. I don't know if that is a proper pronunciation, so I apologize if I've got that if I've got that really messed up. I'm so sorry, but I'm gonna send you an unmute request now. Yes, you are absolutely right. I'm DJ uh, from India. Oh, okay. Nice My to meet you. My first name is Arikal. Oh, you too. Okay. Actually, yes, I really I appreciate your I class. See. Wow. I, nice. I like your class. I really like your presentation because I did go through several uh, tutorials and everything, but you are doing your presentation in a standardized manner. So unfortunately, I was not in a position to participate in your last class. I'm wondering whether I can download. Do you have any YouTube channel? Yes. Yes, we do. And and actually, if you are, are you subscribed to the to the TTJ newsletter by any chance? No, I want to subscribe it. How can I do that? Okay. What you want to do, because I'm going to send a, an email to the newsletter probably later today with that YouTube link. That's what I was just telling the other participant, um, I waited a little bit to send it because a bunch of people were subscribing to the newsletter. So I, I thought I'd, I'd wait a little bit. But uh, what it is, if you go to the website, now the web address is ttjtech.biz. So that's like, that's T TTJ as in tech Tango. Uh, ttjtech.biz. Right. So dot T -I -Z. is in... Right. Mm -hmm. 
Bis B I S or B U S? B I Z is in zebra. Okay. Yes. Zebra. T T J Tech dot B I Z. Am I right? Correct. Okay, I will looking to that. And do you teach yeah. any another subject more than voiceover and uh, uh, iOS? Do you teach any another subject? So I'm, we teach a lot of a lot of Apple, uh, you know, iPad, and we teach different apps on the iPad and and like teach, Logic Pro. Do you teach Logic Pro with the Mac? So one one of our partners, the gentleman who was speaking a little bit earlier, trainer Cliff, would probably huh. be the person that. Ultimately, will offer a Logic Pro uh, class, or if he doesn't, he knows who to put you in touch with. I was about to say, you really putting the bar up there for you, ain't you? <laughs> <laughs> I have, a, I have, you, a you, you have somebody voiceover. who teaches it, though, right, Cliff? Yeah, I, I do. I know somebody who has. They actually have a mailing list where you can ask all kinds of questions. They have free YouTube tutorials and stuff that you can get a hold of, and he answers any huh. question because I have a lot of questions. So yeah, if you, I, I, Matt, just put my. Uh, my newsletter subscription info in there. So when I send that announcement out about the Mac class and people who want to know about Logic Pro, they all can get that information. So we don't, I don't have to jump around to two different newsletters. Okay. Remember, all minus, right. So remember you just, minus, you stir, just... minus stir it up plus subscribe at googlegroups.com. And okay. you're in Google Groups. Right. Right. So did you, if you just go to the ttjtech.biz and okay. subscribe to the newsletter there, then, then you'll uh-huh. get all the info you need. Okay, thank you. And uh, what about the old class? Will I get a copy of your last class? I was not in a position to attend that. Of the iPad uh, class or the yeah, iPad class also. Can I get the tutorials? Yes, they're all on YouTube. They're, they're on YouTube. Uh, so once you and subscribe so, okay, to the okay. YouTube channel, you'll be able to access the uh, playlist for that. And there's also a, a connection playlist to the Mac last year's more with the Mac class that we had. So, so your uh, website I'm just opening www.ttj.tech.biz. Am I right? That is correct. correct. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. I really. Now to meet you when All I right. come to the United States. Okay, hit that. Do to that subscribe oh, awesome. and then. So okay, great. And I am also starting All a right. new All channel right. nice for the be. blind, for audio description. Oh, good. In yeah. India. In India for international also because now I am doing some shooting with elephant because blind people do not know how big is an elephant, how much its weight and everything. So we are doing some research in the forest right now with animals. Wonderful. Oh, wow. Wow. That's incredible. So I will let you. And I want somebody. Uh, can I get some volunteers to describe my channel? If I give some list, especially for the U.S. people, I have somebody in India for doing the sound. There um, have you there's an audio describe description group um, in the U.S., but I oh I don't know their address. If you Google, I know ACB. I, I have I have done my training, but I want some I will do my scripting for audio description, but I want somebody's voiceover. I can give the voice to somebody. I want somebody to record it. Oh, oh, boy. I do not know. <laughs> I'm about to say that way, but my pay great. Yeah, uh, uh, there there are, you know, professional voiceover, you know, this is actual work, you know, to, to okay. do. The- uh, yeah, I know somebody to do work for me. I will pay some money for them. I, I would uh, contact the audio description because they may know some professional. Yeah, I, mean, they I, know. I also know them. I will speak with them. Don't worry. Okay. All righty. Okay. Are All you right. Name? All right. You are, may I know your name, everybody's name, if you don't mind. I'm sorry, what? Your name, your name. Oh, it's, there's Matt is the teacher, Rita ah. and Cliff. Okay. 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 We're with TTJ Tech. Okay, okay, okay. I like your class. Matt's class is very good and he's explaining oh. everything in a standardized yeah. manner. Yeah, he's excellent. Isn't he good? Okay. <laughs> great okay, great to have you. Soon. Just don't tell him because okay. his head will get big. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Matt is a teacher. Matt is a teacher. Professionally, he's a teacher. Yes. If you go to that ttjtech.biz, it'll describe all of his products and resources and tutorials. 
It's got all kinds of resources there. Okay. Thank you, Edmonds. Okay. All righty. Bye. Okay. All right, bye. You take care. Thank